Section 14 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Kelly. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. The Bloodhound. His snuffling nose, his active tail, attest his joy then with deep opening mouth that makes the welkin tremble he proclaims the audacious felon foot by foot he marks his winding way while all the listening crowd applaud his reasonings o'er the watery ford dry sandy heaths and stony barren hills o'er beaten paths with men and beasts disdained unerring he pursues till at the cot arrived and seizing by his guilty throat the caitiff vile redeems the captive prey so exquisitely delicate his sense somerville these noble dogs were also called slough dogs in consequence of their exploring the sloughs mosses and bogs in pursuit of offenders called moss troopers they were used for this purpose as late as the reign of james i in scotland they are called the sleuth hound it is the largest of any variety of hound, some of them having measured from 26 to 28 inches to the top of the shoulder. They are beautifully formed and have a noble expression of countenance, so finely portrayed in Sir Edwin Landseer's well-known and beautiful picture of dignity and impudence. There is, as Colonel Hamilton Smith has observed, a kind of sagacious or serious solemn dignity about him, admirably calculated to impress the marauder with dread and awe indeed so much is the case that i knew an instance of a bloodhound having traced a sheep-stealer to his cottage in bedfordshire and so great was the dread afterwards of the peculiar instinct of this dog that sheep-stealing which had before been very common in the neighbourhood was put an end to it has therefore often occurred to me that if bloodhounds were kept for the general good in different districts sheep-stealing would be less frequent than it is at present they might also be usefully employed in the detection of rick-burners at all events the suggestion is worth some consideration especially from insurance offices in eighteen o three the thrapston association for the prosecution of felons in northamptonshire procured and trained a bloodhound for the detection of sheep-stealers in order to prove the utility of the dog a man was dispatched from a spot where a great concourse of people were assembled at ten o'clock in the forenoon and an hour afterwards the hound was laid on the scent after a chase of an hour and a half the hound found him secreted in a tree many miles from the place of starting the very knowledge that farmers could readily have recourse to the assistance of such a dog would serve to prevent the commission of much crime to try whether a young bloodhound was well instructed a nobleman says mr boyle caused one of his servants to walk to a town four miles off and then to a market town three miles from thence the dog without seeing the man he was to pursue followed him by the scent to the above-mentioned places notwithstanding the multitude of people going the same road and of travellers that had occasion to cross it when the hound came to the chief market town he passed through the streets without noticing any of the people there till he got to the house where the man he sought was and there found him in an upper room a sure way of stopping the dog was to spill blood upon the track which destroyed the discriminating fineness of his scent a captive was sometimes sacrificed on such occasions henry the minstrel tells us a romantic story of wallace founded on this circumstance the hero's little band had been joined by an irishman named fawden or fadzen a dark savage and suspicious character after a sharp skirmish at black urnside wallace was forced to retreat with only sixteen followers the english pursued with a border sleuth bratch or bloodhound in the retreat fawden tired 
or affecting to be so, would go no farther. Wallace, having in vain argued with him, in hasty anger struck off his head and continued the retreat. When the English came up, their hound stayed upon the dead body. To the present group has been referred by some naturalists a dog of Spanish descent, termed the Cuban bloodhound. A hundred of these sagacious but savage dogs were sent in 1795 from the Havana to Jamaica to extinguish the Maroon War, which at that time was fiercely raging. They were accompanied by forty Spanish chasseurs, chiefly people of color, and their appearance and that of the dogs struck terror into the negroes. The dogs, muzzled and led in leashes, rushed ferociously upon every object dragging along the chasseurs in spite of all their endeavors. Dallas, in his History of the Maroons, informs us that General Walpole ordered a review of these dogs, and the men, that he might see in what manner they would act. He set out for a place called Seven Rivers, accompanied by Colonel Skinner, whom he appointed to conduct the attack. Notice of his coming having preceded him, a parade of the chasseurs was ordered and they were taken to a distance from the house in order to be advanced when the general alighted. On his arrival, the commissioner, who had procured the dogs, having paid his respects, was desired to parade them. The Spaniards soon appeared at the end of a gentle acclivity drawn out in a line containing upwards of forty men with their dogs in front unmuzzled and held by cotton ropes. On receiving the command, Fire!, they discharged their fusils and advanced as upon a real attack. This was intended to ascertain what effect would be produced on the dogs if engaged under a fire of the maroons. The volley was no sooner discharged than the dogs rushed forward with the greatest fury amid the shouts of the Spaniards, who were dragged on by them with irresistible force. Some of the dogs, maddened by the shout of attack, while held back by the ropes, seized on the stocks of the guns in the hands of their keepers and tore pieces out of them. Their impetuosity was so great that they were with difficulty stopped before they reached the general, who found it necessary to get expeditiously into the chaise from which he had alighted, and if the most strenuous exertions had not been made, they would have seized upon his horses." This terrible exhibition produced the intended effect. The Maroons at once capitulated, and were subsequently sent to Halifax, North America. Mr. John Lawrence says that a servant, discharged by a sporting country gentleman, broke into his stables by night and cut off the ears and tail of a favorite hunter. As soon as it was discovered, a bloodhound was brought into the stable, who at once detected the scent of the miscreant, and traced it more than twenty miles. He then stopped at a door, whence no power could move him. Being at length admitted, he ran to the top of the house, and bursting open the door of a garret, found the object that he sought in bed, and would have torn him to pieces had not the huntsman who had followed him on a fleet horse rushed up after him. Colonel Hamilton Smith says that he was favored with the following interesting notice of this dog from Sir Walter Scott, and which agrees exactly with some I have seen bred by Lord Bagot at Blythefield in Staffordshire, and some belonging to Her Present Majesty. The only sleuth-hound I ever saw was one which was kept at Kildare Castle. He was like the Spanish pointer, but much stronger, and untamably fierce, color black and tawny, long pendulous ears, had a deep back, broad nostrils, and was strongly made, something like the old English mastiff, now so rare. Wanley, in his Wonders of the Little World, relates the following anecdote. Anno Dom 867. Lothbrook, of the blood royal of Denmark, and father to Humbar and Hubba, entered with his hawk into a boat alone, and by tempest was driven upon the coast of Norfolk in England, where being found he was detained and presented to Edmund, at that time king of the East Angles. The king entertained him at his court, 
and perceiving his singular dexterity and activity in hawking and hunting, bore him particular favor. By this means he fell into the envy of Barrick, the king's falconer, who one day, as they hunted together, privately murdered and threw him into a bush. It was not long before he was missed at court. When no tidings could be heard of him, his dog, who had continued in the wood with the corpse of his master, till famine forced him thence, at sundry times came to court and fawned on the king, so that the king, suspecting some ill matter, at length followed the trace of the hound, and was led by him to the place where Lothbrook lay. Inquisition was made, and by circumstance of words and other suspicions, Barrick, the king's falconer, was pronounced to be his murderer. The king commanded him to be set alone in Lothbrook's boat, and committed to the mercy of the sea, by the working of which he was carried to the same coast of Denmark from which Lothbrook came. The boat was well known, and the occupant, Barrick, examined by torments. To save himself he asserted that Lothbrook had been slain by King Edmund, and this was the first occasion of the Dane's arrival in this land. A planter had fixed his residence at the foot of the Blue Mountains in the back settlements of America. One day the youngest of his family, a child of about four years old, disappeared. The father, becoming alarmed, explored the woods in every direction but without success. On the following day the search was renewed, during which a native Indian happened to pass, accompanied by his dog, one of the true bloodhound breed. Being informed of the distress of the planter, he requested that the shoes and stockings last worn by the child might be brought to him. He made the dog smell to them and patted him. The intelligent animal seemed to comprehend all about it, for he began immediately to sniff around. The Indian and his dog then plunged into the wood. They had not been there long before the dog began to bay. He thought that he had hit upon the scent, and presently afterwards, being assured of it, he uttered a louder and more expressive note, and darted off at full speed into the forest. The Indian followed, and after a considerable time met his dog bounding back, his noble countenance beaming with animation. The hound turned again into the wood, his master not being far behind, and they found the child lying at the foot of a tree, fatigued and exhausted, but otherwise unhurt. Some of these dogs are kept by the keepers in the royal parks and forests and are used to trace wounded deer. An officer in the first lifeguards has two noble dogs of this description, for one of which I am informed he gave fifty pounds. In fact, they are by no means uncommon in England. One distinguishing trait of purity in the breed is the color, which is almost invariably a reddish tan, progressively darkening to the upper part, with a mixture of black upon the back. In the Spanish West India Islands, says Bingley, there are officers called chasseurs kept in continual employment. The business of these men is to traverse the country with their dogs for the purpose of pursuing and taking up all persons guilty of murder or other crimes, and no activity on the part of the offenders will enable them to escape. The following is a very remarkable instance, which happened not many years ago. A fleet from Jamaica, under convoy to Great Britain, passing through the Gulf of Mexico, beat upon the north side of Cuba. One of the ships, manned with foreigners, chiefly renegado Spaniards, in standing in with the land at night, was run on shore. The officers and the few British seamen on board were murdered, and the vessel was plundered by the renegados. The part of the coast on which the vessel was stranded, being wild and unfrequented, the assassins retired with their booty to the mountains intending to penetrate through the woods to some remote settlements on the southern side, where they hoped to secure themselves and elude all pursuit. Early intelligence of the crime had, however, been conveyed to Havana. The assassins were pursued by a detachment of the Chasseurs del Rey, with their dogs, 
and in the course of a very few days they were every one apprehended and brought to justice. The dogs carried out by the Chasseurs del Rey are all perfectly broken in. On coming up with the fugitive, they bark at him till he stops. Then they crouch near him, terrifying him with a ferocious growling if he attempts to stir. In this position they continue barking to give notice to the chasseurs who come up and secure their prisoner. Each chasseur can only hunt with two dogs. These people live with their dogs and are inseparable from them. At home the animals are kept chained, and when walking out with their masters they are never unmuzzled nor let out of ropes but for attack. Bloodhounds were formerly used in certain districts lying between England and Scotland that were much infested by robbers and murderers, and a tax was laid on the inhabitants for keeping and maintaining a certain number of these animals. But as the arm of justice is now extended over every part of the country, and as there are now no secret recesses where villainy can be concealed, their services in this respect are become no longer necessary. Some few of these dogs, however, are yet kept in the northern parts of the kingdom and in the lodges of the royal forests, where they are used in pursuit of deer that have been previously wounded. They are also sometimes employed in discovering deer stealers, whom they infallibly trace by the blood that issues from the wounds of their victims. A very extraordinary instance of this occurred in the New Forest in the year 1810, and was related to me by the Right Honorable G. H. Rose. A person, in getting over a stile into a field near the forest, remarked that there was blood upon it. Immediately afterwards he recollected that some deer had been killed and several sheep stolen in the neighborhood and that this might possibly be the blood of one that had been killed in the preceding night. The man went to the nearest lodge to give information, but the keeper being from home, he was under the necessity of going to Rhinefield Lodge, which was at a considerable distance. Toomer, the underkeeper, went with him to the place accompanied by a bloodhound. The dog, when brought to the spot, was laid on the scent, and after following for about a mile the track which the depredator had taken, he came at last to a heap of furs, faggots, belonging to the family of a cottager. The woman of the house attempted to drive the dog away, but was prevented, and on the faggots, being removed, a hole was discovered in the ground, which contained the body of a sheep that had recently been killed, and also a considerable quantity of salted meat. The circumstance which renders this account the more remarkable is that the dog was not brought to the scent until more than sixteen hours had elapsed after the man had carried away the sheep. An old writer, the author of the history of the buccaneers, though full of prejudice against the Indians, thus describes some of the atrocities practiced by the Spaniards. The Spaniards, having possessed themselves of these isles, South America, found them peopled with Indians, a barbarous people, sensual and brutish, hating all labor, and only inclined to killing and making war against their neighbors, not out of ambition, but only because they agreed not with themselves in some common terms of language and perceiving that the dominion of the Spaniards laid great restrictions upon their lazy and brutish customs, they conceived an irreconcilable hatred against them, but especially because they saw them take possession of their kingdoms and dominions. Hereupon they made against them all the resistance they could, everywhere opposing their designs to the utmost, and the Spaniards, finding themselves cruelly hated by the Indians, and nowhere secure from their treacheries, resolved to extirpate and ruin them, since they could neither tame them by civility nor conquer them by the sword. But the Indians, it being their custom to make the woods their chief places of defense, 
at present made these their refuge whenever they fled from the Spaniards. Hereupon those first conquerors of the New World made use of dogs to range and search the intricate thickets of woods and forests for those their implacable and unconquerable enemies. Thus they forced them to leave their old refuge and submit to the sword, seeing no milder usage would do it. Hereupon they killed some of them, and quartering their bodies placed them in the highways, that others might take warning from such a punishment. But this severity proved of ill consequence, for instead of frightening them and reducing them to civility, they conceived such horror of the Spaniards that they resolved to detest and fly their sight for ever. Hence the greatest part died in caves and subterraneous places of woods and mountains, in which places I myself have often seen great numbers of human bones. It has been already stated that in the West Indies bloodhounds were employed to hunt the runaway blacks. I had one of these Cuban bloodhounds given to me a few years ago, and finding him somewhat more ferocious than I liked, I made a present of him to a keeper in the neighborhood. He was put into a kennel with other dogs, and soon killed some of them. Keepers, however, in going their rounds at night, are frequently accompanied by bloodhounds, and poachers are said to have a great dread of them. End of the Bloodhound Recording by Julia Kelly, Knoxville, Tennessee, USA